Lynn Stewart, happy birthday. We're talking about jazz today, and I saw that there was a request for a jazzy happy birthday. So jazz uh, can mean a lot of things, and we're going to talk a lot about what it can mean today. But first off, everybody say happy birthday to Lynn Stewart. Happy birthday. Now, we are talking jazz today because, well, that was the most voted on new topic in the user voice. And for those who don't know, on user voice, we are, uh, let's take a look actually at the live feed of user voice. Here is what we are going to be, oh, let's get jazz off of there. Um, let's, <laughs> uh, this is the topic uh, voting forum here. So Wednesday live lessons here on YouTube are now selected from user voice. Go check it out if you haven't done it yet. You can easily create a free account and then you're in and you can vote not only on these but also on songs for our interactive app and more. Uh, so it looks like, aside from the lessons that were already published um, and then the one that's scheduled, which is jazz, which is what we're doing right now, it looks like our front runner is uh, steps from selecting a song uh, through learning and, and, and that whole journey. And so right now, uh, I think that looks like the front runner, but uh, you guys still have some time to vote if you want to get in there and either upvote that or come up with a new suggestion. But today, we're talking about jazz. So that means a few things. And this really is a gigantic topic, all right? It can be. There, in fact, my whole college degree was in jazz performance. So it's, it can be a deep study, uh, but that doesn't have to mean that it is impenetrable for rookie and intermediate players. Uh, in fact, I believe there's a lot that we can uh, jump into jazz even if we're just starting out at the piano. So today's theme is going to sort of be getting started with jazz. I know many of us here in this particular community of the, these Wednesday evening live lessons, um, we're, I think there's a good interest in jazz and blues and improvisation, uh, but I think that we're still around, uh, on average, an intermediate to rookie level community at the moment, and that's totally cool. So we're going to focus this around sort of getting started with jazz. And for me, uh, this will be sort of an overview of where we're going to go with today's lesson. For me, uh, some of the starting points with jazz are going to have to do with harmony, rhythm, and improvisation. Now, on the harmony side, there's all sorts of weird chords you can get into, and I was trying to experiment with a few for Lynn's birthday song up front, uh, but some of the chords I was playing you know, our, our altered dominance. Uh, I was also playing some like minor major seven type stuff. And then I was throwing in some two fives. I'm gonna get into some of that stuff, but you don't have to understand all of that to be able to get into some of the basic jazz harmony. Now, we're gonna build off of what we talked about in some of our more recent lessons about the blues, where we talked about seventh chords. We talked about dominant seventh chords, but we also hinted at major seven and minor seven chords. Now, if you can add a seventh to a major or a minor or a, well, or a major or a minor chord, then you're already a, a nice step towards playing some more jazzy harmonies. And so we're gonna cover a bit of that today. And on the rhythm side, um, many of you may already be familiar with the term swing, but that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, by no means does jazz equal swing necessarily. Sometimes you can have music that's not jazz that still swings. You can also have jazz music that doesn't swing. But I think if we're getting started with jazz, it's important to understand swing and to be able to identify it and even uh, be able to uh, play it or approach being able to play swing. So we're going to talk through a bit of that as well. And then I also want to talk about improvisation, which of course is uh, one of those large umbrella topics. It could mean something as basic as, I'm going to make up a song like this. Okay, I improvised that because I didn't know what I was going to play when I started. It could also be something as crazy as, you know, uh, some modern free jazz where it's all kind of gestural. Uh, whew. I wasn't expecting that either, right? And there's all sorts of stuff in between. Um, and so with improv today, just like the rest of these topics, we're going to sort of scratch the surface and talk about a way to enter into that world, even if you're a beginner. So first, let's talk about harmony. Actually, first, let's get into the chat. I want to say hey to you guys. I love these live lessons in part because we're truly live and I'm truly here watching and listening. Well, I'm reading uh, from you guys. 
Robert Atkins in the building, full stomach from Taco Wednesday. That's what's up. I love tacos. Uh, Joe, what's up? Some Le Jazz Hot. Yes, sir. Hey, Sarah Pickles. Elta John in the house. What's up? Pat Sir, what's going on? Hey, Jeanette. Hey, Jamie Shilley. Lynn Stewart. Uh, let's see here. Who else is hanging today? So Robert's saying that he's not a huge fan of jazz. We're going to try and change that today, Robert. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some different styles of jazz, and maybe you'll find one that you like. Charles Smith, what's going on? Jeanette, hey, Jeanette's been doing some beta testing in the new app. That's exciting. Uh, Jeanette, I think I agree with you that it's going to be outstanding, but it's not quite ready yet. I agree. I can't wait for it to be ready. We've been working really, really hard on it. Uh, and I'm glad that you're seeing uh, some positive stuff. John Anderson, what's up? All right, blessing. Greetings from Chechnya, nice. Midnight here, I'm excited to have you. Uh, guys, by the way, as I'm going through the chat, leave any questions and comments that you may have that are jazz related, and I promise I'm gonna get to them today. Uh, again, I wanna use your input to help steer these lessons to make sure I'm giving you guys what you wanna learn. What else? Hey, Saul Mulgrave. Hey, uh, oh, Plinky Plonky in the house. What's up? I love when I see your name in the chat. Hey, Robert Simonoff. All right, so let's see here. Are there any jazz-related things up front? Maybe not, and that's okay. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and jump into some harmony. And uh, actually, I do see one, one comment here that I'll get into, and then we're going to talk about uh, some harmony to kick things off. I see two questions about the same thing. Jennifer and Saul are asking, Sal, excuse me, are asking, uh, is there a book to learn jazz chords? So uh, I'm going to teach you guys the basics of major sevenths, minor sevenths, and dominant sevenths today. And you are probably going to be able to find those chords even in a non-jazz book. Uh, what I will say as sort of a caveat or as a, almost as a warning, if you get a jazz harmony book, most often it's going to be pretty dense. It's going to get pretty deep into covering some of the more complex chords that I was showcasing in the beginning. Uh, and if that's what you want to jump into, by all means, go for it. But I just want to give you that heads up. Uh, having said that, my favorite jazz harmony book that I've encountered is by Frank Mantooth, and I believe the book is called Jazz Piano Voicings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew and Aiden both have that as well. Uh, I have it from back in my college days, and it's like sc all scribbled on, and uh, all my notes are on it. It does a really good job of explaining things like how to take a chord that's typically based in thirds and spreading it into a fourth space voicing, which is so much more open and, and, uh, and jazzy, if you will. Uh, and it goes also way beyond that. I really, really love that book. I highly recommend it to anyone that wants to get deeper into jazz harmony. Um, but for today, we're going to cover the surface a bit more. Uh, and so we talked in our blues lesson about dominant seventh chords, right? A dominant seventh chord is a major triad, and we'll keep it in C, with a flat seven. So here's the major, major triad. A C major seven would actually just be that, a major triad with the natural seventh. So everyone that's got a piano or keyboard in front of them, whether it's your right hand or left hand or both, why don't you guys try that now for me. This is a standard root position, thirds based, or stacks of thirds intervals, C major seven chord. Now if we wanted to make this a dominant seventh chord, it would still be a major triad, but we would take the seventh and we would flat it. That is a C dominant seventh chord. Now the third chord I want to cover today is a minor seventh chord, and that would be a minor triad, so flat the third, and it also has a minor seventh, or a flat seventh. Those are the three chords I want to cover. So once again, C major seven, C dominant seven, we're going to flat the seventh, C minor seven, we're going to flat the third. Now, those are our three sort of basic harmony or quality of chords that I want us to stick with today for jazz. And they were all built off of the same root for that example. But 
One thing that is super duper common in jazz when we're talking about harmony is something called a 2-5-1. And a 2-5-1 refers to a chord progression. So let's say we're in the key of C. A 2-5-1 refers to three different chords within our key. The 2 chord, and then the 5 chord, and then the 1 chord. Now before we add sevenths to those chords, let's just talk about the basic triad. It's either going to be major or minor, right? So the 2 chord in the key of C is the chord that is built from the second scale degree. So the 1 chord, of course, would be C, and we can see that at the end we're going to land on that C chord. But we're going to start here on the 2 chord, which by nature is minor. D minor, root position for now, and then we're going to jump up to the 5 chord, or the chord that's built from the 5th scale degree, which is G. So G major, that's our 5 chord for now, and then C for the 1 chord. So 2, 5, 1, there you have it. That's in its most bare bones form, but 2, 5, 1 is the minor 2 chord, the major 5 chord, and the major one chord. Now I'm going to add to that a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to loop it a few times, and I'm going to show you how that can build into something that really does sound like very, very many jazz standards. Two, five, one. You can do some inversions as well. left hand. All right, so of course you can add more to that. And one of the things I was adding in the right hand was the seventh of each of these chords. So let's come back to this idea of adding the seventh. Either it's going to be a major seven, a minor 7 or a dominant 7. So let's go back to the 2 chord, D minor. Now adding the 7th here means C. And that's because this is the key that we're in, right? So this happens to be a minor 7 chord. D minor 7, that's our full 2 chord. And then we're going to go up to the 5 chord and add that 7. What do we get here? Well, it's a major triad with a flat 7, and that means a dominant 7th chord, right? We talked about this in our blues lesson. So let's go from the 2 to the 5, so D minor 7, now moving it up to G7. Now we're going to go back down to C major 7, so C major triad, adding the natural 7. Let's do the whole thing, D minor 7. G7, now C major 7. If you want to add a left hand root, be my guest. Okay, now there's something else that my ear really wants to hear with this progression, and that is some better voice leading. And what I mean by that is I don't want to jump around so much between my chord shapes. So we have D minor 7, and then we have to jump way up here to G7, and then jump way back down to C major 7. Now let's forget about the 5 chord for a second. D minor 7 and C major 7 are very close. In fact, I believe that's like the Mario Brothers theme song when you get a star, right? <laughs> the, the 2 minor, uh, minor 7 to the, the 1 major 7. I couldn't resist. Uh, now, if we add the 5 back in, we're going to have to jump a bunch, not if we do an inversion of the 5 chord. So let's talk about how we do an inversion of a 4 note chord. We already know how to do an inversion of a 3 note chord. We take the bottom note, we bring it up an octave, do it again, do it again. So we just basically change the order of the chords 
of the notes in the chord, excuse me. And the same rule applies for four note chords. We just have an extra inversion. So here's our 5-7 chord in root position. Now we'll take the G off the bottom and bring it up to the top. So we have B, D, F, G. Now we can invert it again, bringing the B up top. We have D, F, G, B. Still the same chord, right? Same quality, same harmony. It's just notes are in a slightly different order. We can do it again, bring the D up to the top. We have F, G, B, D. If we do it again, we're back to our root position. So one of the functional reasons that we, we want to use inversions in a chord progression is so that we can minimize the movement between chords. We already know that D minor 7 is here, C major 7 is very close by. So our goal here should be to find an inversion of our 5 chord that is within that range so we don't have to jump. And here's how I would do that. See that? There it is. Those are all four notes in my G7 chord. G, B, D, and F. It's just in a different order. That order allows us to only have to move two notes, and we only move them by one scale degree down. The other two notes stay the same. Now from here, guess what? These two notes are part of our one chord. So I barely have to move down to that one as well. So that's what I want everyone to take away with our 2-5-1 progression with sevenths and an inversion on the 5 chord. That's a mouthful, but I know you guys are with me. Here's the 2. Now watch, I'm just moving my top two notes down. Now my bottom two notes down. And if you want to, you can bring that top note to a little C6. That's always fun. All right. So 251, any questions about that? Do we have any jazz questions at all? Do we have any yes. questions about? Okay, good, we do. Ah, this is an interesting question and a good one. I love that we're thinking about the source of this stuff. Robert Atkins says, any consensus where jazz came from? Now jazz is such a big term uh, and it, at this point in our history, it really can be describing a lot of different kinds of music, right? So first of all, I think we should, we should say that. We should say that there's so many different kinds of jazz. As, uh, as somebody said up front, there's some Kenny G, there's Django Reinhardt. Those two names in and of, just with those two alone, are covering so much time and different styles. Um, but I think it is really important to be able to trace this stuff back to African music, to African American music. Uh, that's really what this is. Um, and in fact, a lot of the rhythmic nature of jazz music could even be traced back to African drumming. Uh, but African American music uh, coming from spirituals, uh, like hymns, uh, that kind of tradition, work songs, things like that. Um, we then go to New Orleans and we see an evolution. I mean, there's stuff in between that as well. I'm going to be skipping stuff. But uh, we, we then kind of get into the 20s in New York City and we, we get into big band stuff. But it all kind of comes from that source and it's truly an African American art form. Uh, and that's definitely, uh, there's a lot to talk about in that and in fact maybe that can be a topic, kind of tracing the evolution through the different styles. That's right, yeah, I would have to prepare for that one too because it's been a long time since I've studied this stuff, but it really is important. So thanks, great question, Robert. Charles Smith asks, can you show a good voicing for a C9 with middle C as the top note? <laughs> sure. There you go. Third and seven in the left hand. And then I like to put the root there, and then I like to fill in with fourths when I can. That gives me the root, the fifth, and the ninth. C9 implies C dominant 7 with a 2 in there, with a 9 in there. There you go. That works. Uh, I won't get into that for everyone else, but I just, I'll throw that in there for you, Charles. Oh, I didn't even see. Andrew did suggest that. Did suggest that. That's awesome. Uh, Elta John says, I always have a hard time with all the multiple sharps and flats with jazz music. I find it confusing. Yep. I, I'm with you, Elta. Uh, any good approaches? I would say that first, um, remember that a flat and a sharp on a chord 
What that really means is that you're altering a note within the chord. So in order to understand the alterations, you first need to understand the notes without the alterations. So if you see a chord with, let's say it says C7, sharp 9, sharp 5. First, and before you can ever hope to understand that, you need to be able to understand what a C7 is and what the 5 and the 9 are supposed to be. So uh, Charles Smith just asked about a C9. Well, really that's a C7 chord with a 9. A C7 sharp 9, well, take the 9 and sharp it. C7 sharp 5 sharp 9, take the 5 and sharp it. And that's that chord I was just playing. So yeah, I mean, it is really tricky, Alta, for sure. And that's why I was saying that some of these jazz harmony books can get really dense uh, and heady. Uh, because it, jazz harmony is all about altering and substituting uh, harmony. And so, yeah, I'm with you. That's why jazz can feel a bit intimidating. But for now, I just want to keep it to seventh chords. Major sevens, minor sevens, and dominant sevens. To answer your question directly, any good approaches? I think you got to study the theory, you got to study the chord, uh, the notes that make up the chord, and all of the notes that are available to you as color notes on top of chords, such as the 9, the 13, the sharp 11 even. Jamie Shilley asks, what is your all-time favorite jazz song for a beginner? Great question. There are several good ones to start with. I think there are a lot of names that may sound familiar to you guys, maybe like Fly Me to the Moon or, you know, um, things like that, Autumn Leaves. But those are not necessarily the, the easiest to dig into. There is a lot of harmony and a lot of uh, quick changes in the progression. What I would suggest is you look for a jazz song that leans heavily on the blues. And one of my favorites is Blue Monk. And that goes something like this. Now, you can get really fancy with that or keep it simple. The left hand is, uh, the harmony I should say, for the most part, is based on the blues that we've already covered. Check out Blue Monk. I think where it sounds jazzy is in the chromatic melody. Okay, that's a good one to start with, and there's a ton. I think that it's worth, uh, uh, doing a, a search, I think there's, you're going to find a lot, of, a lot of good stuff, but I would say that you probably want to anchor in a more bluesy song up front, simply because you're going to have less two five ones spread throughout, and that's where jazz can get tricky. Often you'll find a song that's just a bunch of different two fives. So it's tough to, to comprehend that and walk through that um, unless you're really, really familiar with all of the chords and scales and keys and blah, blah, blah. I said kind of blue. Kind of blue. Kind of blue is a good one, too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And there's a lot of stuff like Freddie Freeloader is based on the, it's a blues, and that melody is a lot easier, too. Totally, totally. So uh, let's talk uh, a bit more about jazz, and I want to get into rhythm. And so there are several different things we could talk about with rhythm, including general syncopation, including rhythmic kind of cliches that I mentioned the Charleston uh, when I was talking about Boogie Woogie last time, right? There's all sorts of little rhythmic devices that you can find often in jazz. The main thing I want to cover today is swing. So what does swing mean? Well, this kind of has a technical definition. One could argue that it's all about feel. You want to have kind of a lazy upbeat, but still stay strong on the downbeats. You could also argue that it's very technical, that you could subdivide all 
beats into groups of threes or triplets. And that's kind of where I want to anchor us. So when we have something written like this, let's see, it would actually be written like this. Let's think about those as eighth notes. One and two and three and four and, okay, one more time. One and two and three and four and. That's not swung. Those are even eighth notes. And you can tell that the distance between them are all the same. Okay. And what I want to do is talk about how to get it from there to swing. Swing would sound like this. Now, how do you know where exactly in the cracks to put those every other notes, right? One, the notes I'm accenting are still on the strong beats. Three, four, one, two, three. But how do you know where to put the other notes? You're supposed to shift them to the right of the beat, but how do you know where? Well, this is where it gets technical, and this is where I think we should lean in and dig into this today. We want to subdivide everything by triplets. We want to be feeling triplets. Now, how do we do that? Triplet, 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 whoops, triplet, 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 triplet. And then that's sort of the first step. The second step then is to remove that middle triplet. So if you think about it as triplet, don't play the p, triplet. Tri, let, tri, let. Think about each beat. One, two, three, four. As actually having three even subdivisions. So one, two, three, four. And we want to play on the first and the third. One, uh, how can I do this? Uh, one, and two. And three, and four, and. That's how you swing. All right, now that sounds kind of really technical. And at the end of the day, hopefully you get to the point where you can just sort of feel that. But that's really how it would be broken down and written out on the page or on the screen, so to speak, here. And so, how do we practice that? Well, any group of eighth notes that you see, if it says to swing the eighth notes, that's what you're going to do. Instead of playing one and two. which really is subdividing into two groups, right? One, two, three, four. Instead, you need to subdivide into groups of three. One, two, three, four. You take your two eighth notes per beat. Your first eighth note goes on the strong beat, on the number. Your second eighth note goes on the third beat, subdivided beat. So, tri -ba let it goes on the let. Triplet, 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 triplet. That's how we swing. Now we're swinging, okay? So again, that's the technical breakdown. What questions do you guys have about rhythm, about swing? I'm going to check back in on the chat here. So, a couple of questions about progressions, uh, learning jazz songs. Um, and so I'm going to give you guys a minute to type on rhythm. In the meantime, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to answer Sal Mulgrave's question. Sal says, how do I remember the main jazz chords? So this is going to go back to really the triads in the scale. And that's why I like to use C major as an example because it's easy to visualize. C major. Those are our triads. And they have a rule, like the one chord is always major because that's the notes that we have in the scale. And it goes down to intervals. One, two, three, four half steps is a major third. One, two, three half steps is a minor third. But really, those are just the notes in the scale I'm building triads from. And the same can be said, two is minor, always. Three is minor, four is major. 
When we add our sevenths to these chords, we're still applying new notes from the scale. So you're basically skipping a note through the scale every other time you end up with your chords here. So the one chord is a major seven chord by nature. Your two chord is a minor seven chord. Your three chord is always a minor seven chord. Four chord is always a major seven. Five chord is the only one that is dominant seven. It's the only one that happens to be a major triad with a flat seven. Six chord, always minor seven. Seven chord is a, is a B, well it's a half, to let's see here. Half diminished, thank you, Andrew. It's a diminished chord, but it's still got kind of the normal uh, flat seven as, as opposed to a fully diminished. But again, we always like to kind of skip over that seven because it's the outlier. But that's, that's my answer to you, Saul, is I would say that just like you memorized, you know, the one chord in a major key is always major. The, the two chords always minor. I suggest that you try the same thing, but with four note chords. It follows the same rules. And it does come down to sort of memorizing it. One is major seven, two is minor seven, five is dominant seven, and one is major seven. And especially as you get into harder keys, it's going to be important that you play through the chords in the scale as an exercise. So instead of always just doing scales, you could do this. And then try it in a different key. Let's try the key of F. Of course, it gets harder when there are black keys in the scale because that key has to be in all of the chords, right? And then try jumping around. Try a progression. Maybe you go one, four, five, one. And then, of course, maybe you try your two, five, one. And then try it with your inversion. Alright, Elta John has a great question about swing. Does swing actually slow the tempo down? Well, if you're not paying attention to your drummer and your bassist, you might actually start to drag a little bit, but that's not the goal. Uh, if you're swinging correctly, your strong beats, or your one, two, three, and four, are going to be even, just like they would be if you were not swinging. So I'm going to try to show you an example here. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. A one, two, three, four. A one, two, three, four. My one, two, three, and four were even in that example, but I was switching between an even or a not swinging rhythmic feel and a swinging rhythmic feel. The notes that do feel delayed, the beats that are actually late, are the beats that fall in between the strong beats, or the ands. One, a, uh, two, a, uh, three, a, uh, four. Instead of one, and, two, and, three, and, four. But if you put your metronome on, and you make sure one, two, three, and four are staying with the metronome, you can switch between even and swung rhythmic feel, and the tempo should not change. Great question. Jamie Shilley asks, how often should you use the pedal for jazz? Well, Jamie, I would say just like in other styles of music, it will depend on the song. There are certain styles where maybe we're playing fast and energetic and rhythmic, and we probably don't want to have like a washy, you know, <laughs> we don't want that, right? So on a song like that, where you have chromatic notes and syncopated rhythms, for example, uh, you don't really want to use the pedal. Now, jazz often can be defined by having more chromatic notes and more syncopated rhythm. So in that sense, maybe in general you might say, I guess you could lean on the pedal less. But then there's also other types of, of jazz music, like a, a nice ballad, where I definitely would consider using the pedal more. Um, this isn't necessarily a jazz standard, but it, I love this song around Christmas time. <laughs> So as I'm getting decorative and flowery in my right hand, uh, and sort of the effect of that is to be cascading, right, uh, then the pedal can definitely help a lot there. 
I would say even outside of jazz, the, the general rules kind of still apply, that if you're doing something slower and sweeter and flowery, the pedal can be your friend. If you're doing something more upbeat, rhythmic, and chromatic, where the harmony is changing more often, then the pedal could be an enemy, okay? Uh, great questions, guys. Lily May has a great question, and then I want to get to our next part uh, where we, actually I'll answer two more questions real quick, uh, and then I want to get to our final part of today's lesson, improvisation. Lily May Music says, what benefit does learning jazz have for a pop artist? You're trying to learn to love it. I'll tell you what, Lily May, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Uh, depending on what your individual goals are, it might not make sense for you to spend time learning jazz, and that's okay. If I was going to do a lesson on rock piano, and you were a classical pianist, you might not want to take that lesson, and that's okay. Now, having, say, having said that, there's always stuff that can cross over between genres. When you learn something in one genre, it often can help your understanding of music in general, which then can be applied to other styles. But uh, Lily May, I think that the best benefit of learning about jazz for pop music would be the addition of, of the seventh to your chords. Now, just because jazz music has a lot of sevenths, doesn't mean that all other styles of music, including pop, are only triads. There are a ton of songs in pop music that have sevenths to them. There are also a ton of songs in pop that ha use uh, the two. So you can do stuff like, uh, like Kind of made that up, but it kind of sounded like something that could be a pop progression. And if we really analyzed that, you might see a lot of added notes to chords. You might see the two. Here you would see a minor seven chord with the added eleventh. Ah, now we're talking. Go down to the F chord and we have a major seven, kind of a six nine sound. So <laughs> there's all sorts of an analysis that you could do here uh, that could. Uh, be easier for you to understand and play if you have a bit more of an understanding of jazz harmony. That's just one example. Uh, I also would say that there are a ton of pop songs that swing, that have swung rhythms. Uh, what's the song? <laughs> it's like... Uh, it's like, is that a Paramore song? <laughs> we're in the wrong, asking the wrong people here, but uh, but that was swung. A bump, 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 triplet, 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 triplet. Okay, so uh, I guess I would say that the the one area where you you may uh, you may not find a benefit in learning jazz would be like memorizing jazz tunes or jazz standards, which is a part of learning jazz. But I would even say that improvisation can be used in pop music. You you may hear me do stuff like this all the time. I'm gonna make something up. Stuff that I'm doing in my right hand to expand on the chords I'm playing has a root in improvisation. I know that I can jump up, add a couple of little flares, and come back down. That's not something I would have to write out to be able to play, and that's because I am comfortable improvising. And that could be uh, something that you bring forward into your pop music as well. One more quick question, and then we're going to get to improv. I Love Books to Read says, what songs use the 2-5-1 chord progression? In jazz music, I would say 90% of jazz standards, maybe more, have a 2-5-1 somewhere in there. Everything except ECM. Yeah, everything except kind of that modern pop jazz, like ECM jazz. And you still may see a 2-5-1 somewhere, but it's not as much of a staple. But all of the great American songbook stuff is really built on that, that idea of a 2-5-1. And you're going to see all sorts of sneaky ones, like... 36251, which is really just a 25 in a different key to a 25 to a 1, but that's for another lesson. Uh, even outside of jazz, you guys, there's there's all sorts of two five ones. You know, I should have said this before, but our progression. If any of you guys remember Maroon 5 before Adam Levine became what he is today, then uh, you may remember. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. 
That's literally that progression we just learned. Two, five, one. I think those are the voicings too, and it swings too. Da -dum -dum. Ba -boom -ba. That swing feel. Uh, you guys can find it anywhere. And in fact, I want to give you guys some unofficial homework. And that would be to, to do some listening and see if you can hear if something's swinging or not. I bet you'll find it even outside of jazz music. Okay, I want to talk about improv for a little bit, you guys. So first, let me kind of set the stage here. Improvisation uh, in the jazz world typically means playing a solo on top of existing structure of harmony. Now that might sound crazy, but an existing structure of harmony really could just be a 2-5-1. That's a structure, that's a progression that we know is there, and it's, it's something we can, we can build on, we can count on. Two, five, one. That can repeat. That is a progression. That's our structure. When we improvise in jazz, we're going to play basically a, a made-up melody that uses notes from those chords. And that's a starting point. Remember, that's all we're doing today. So there are four notes in each of these chords. Our two chord has D, F, A, and C. So as a starting point, you can take your right hand and you can copy the same shape that the left hand's playing. But you can make up a melody, one note at a time, within those notes. Let's check it out. All I'm doing in the right hand, I didn't play any notes outside of what I was playing in each chord in the left hand, but it kind of sounded like a jazz song already, right? That's because I know the structure, and I'm not just making up a song out of nowhere with any random notes. I'm using the rules, and I am making up a melody within those rules. And so there's actually somebody that I'd like to send to right now, uh, and this is our, uh, one of our favorite teachers who, who produced a handful of lessons for our boot camp in the interactive app. For those who don't know, Harry Connick Jr. Uh, came through the studio and recorded some lessons for us, and he talks about improvisation. So I want to let him give you guys a little bit of a taste, and then I'll come back and we'll dig into this a little bit more. Tell me what song that was. I'll give you a second if you want to think about it. You still don't know what it was? That was Jingle Bells. I can prove it to you by something called improvisation. I'm a father, and I have three daughters. And I remember when my daughters were little, like six months old, I said, this is the best. I hope it never changes. And then they become a year, two, five, 10, and I'd say the same thing with my wife, Jill. Oh, I hope this never ends. Now they're 22 and 21 and 16, and I'm saying to myself, this is the best. I hope it never ends. That's what happens with all of these lessons when y'all get together with me. I keep thinking that the one I'm talking about right now is the best, and it gets better. Here I am at my favorite one, improvisation. I love this, and I want you to gather around and pay really close attention because this is something that you can do. It may seem really out there, really far off, but you can, you can really learn how to improvise. I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Each chord that you play is gonna have a couple of notes in it, at least a couple, but probably three, maybe four, even five notes. Let's take one of those chords and break it up into individual notes. So I was just playing in the key of E flat, which is E flat, G, and B flat. What happens if you take one of those notes and repeat it, and then play another one, maybe really high, and then repeat that a couple of times, like. It may not sound like much, but that is the stuff of improvisation. It's taking structure 
and breaking it down and making up something that you feel like making up in the moment based on the structure. Now, it doesn't have to be based on structure. I could just go, that's, that's fine. That's not interesting to me. What makes improvisation interesting are the rules. Imagine you're watching a football game and the quarterback takes the ball and he throws it to the wide receiver and the wide receiver's on his way to score a touchdown, but somebody's in his way. So he runs into the bleachers and he runs out where they sell the hot dogs and beer. And then he comes down, gets back on the field and then goes into the end zone. Is that a touchdown? No, why not? Because he broke the rules. You have to stick to the rules. It's much more exciting for everything in life if you give yourself some rules and work within those rules. You can bend them, but you can't break them. And improvisation is just that. So if I take a song like Jingle Bells, let's improvise just using the melody. I'll snap on two and four. One, two, one, two, three, four. I've already started to change it a little bit. What if I add a couple of different notes? All right, cool. So we're actually going to pause there, you guys. And I just want to say at the end of today's lesson, if you guys are digging Harry's video here, I'm going to let it play out uh, at the end of today's live lesson so you guys can watch the rest. But I just wanted to bring it home and, and remind you guys of, this is really important. This is what Harry says too. There's a structure to this stuff and that makes it accessible. I don't, uh, too often I hear students say, well, I can't just make up a song. Well, I mean, that's really hard for anybody. But if you know the basic structure, you can improvise within that structure. If you can play an E flat chord, like Harry said, which is just E flat, G, and B flat, well, can you find other E flats or G's or B flats on the piano? I can find these, 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 these. You can make up stuff within any of those notes. So I might just play this chord and do this. Why not? <laughs> That's improvising. Now, is that your favorite song? Well, maybe not, but it doesn't have to be. Everything you do when you improvise doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It's about the creation and it's about the exploration. And to me, that's where the fun lies with improvisation. So Harry uh, is a master improviser and a master jazz musician, and we're lucky to have him. Uh, I hope you guys will check out his lessons if you haven't already. Uh, but the main thing that I wanted to talk about is just hammering home Harry's point. So I want you guys to practice two five ones. And if that's all that you can do, just the chords, that's okay, I want you to practice that. But if that's something that comes easier to you, I want you to put the two, the five, and the one into your left hand, and I want you to practice getting the right hand ready to improvise using those chord shapes. We'll do it one at a time here, ready? The two chord. You could do this. Well, that sounds like a cool melody, but I'm just playing that same exact chord right here, one note at a time. You can go back down. Now go to the five chord. Okay, now to the one chord. Any pattern you want to make up in the right hand to outline that chord is 100% guaranteed gonna sound right and sound good if you're using the notes from the chord. Here's another thing to think about. The two, the five, and the one are all part of the key of C, right? Well, guess what? That means any note in your C scale, for the most part, will work. <laughs> for now, let's just say they all will work uh, over any of those three chords. So check this out. I'm just going to mess around in the C major scale. sorts of stuff you can do with that basic structure. Scale of the key that you're in or chord tones from the chords you're playing. I really hope you guys 
enjoy that, and I hope that that feels more accessible to you than maybe you expected at the beginning of the lesson. And I really hope, was it Charles Smith or was it Robert Atkins? I really hope that Robert Atkins found a slight bit of extra joy with jazz than he had when, uh, when we started the lesson. But if not, that's okay too. Hey guys, you know, someone mentioned Amy Winehouse in the chat. That's a great example, Lily Mae, of a crossover pop artist with some jazz, not even undertones, sometimes overtones. She is, uh, she did, a, I think, a great thing for, for bringing jazz rhythms and harmonies uh, to the pop world. So check her out, everyone. Uh, we're going to end things on a pop quiz really quick, and then I'm going to let Harry play the rest of his lesson out for us to end things for today. Real quick, before we jump in, I want to remind everyone, use your voice. Make sure you vote on the next topic for next week. The pop quiz for today is going to have to do with seventh chords. We talked about how you have triads, major triad or a minor triad. Then you add the seventh on top of the triad and it makes a new chord, right? You have a major triad, you add the natural seventh to it, this becomes a major seven chord. Major triad, natural seven. What is the formula following that same phrase? I said major triad, natural seven. What is that formula for a minor seven chord? Describe the triad, describe the seventh. First, first two correct answers are going to get it because minor seven is our two chord in a two five one progression. First two correct answers are going to take it. How would you describe a minor seven chord? What kind of a quality of a triad is it? And what is the seventh? Is it a natural seventh? Is it a flat seventh? Is it a sharp seventh? I hope nobody puts that. <laughs> so I'm going to give you guys a chance to write your answers in the chat here, and I'm going to play around with a little bit of a 2-5-1 progression. Two five ones can also just repeat on themselves forever, so excuse me. All right, now let's get back to this chat here. We have some answers here, and I'm going to go through and make sure. Uh, I love Robert Atkins' strategy. He just, <laughs> he just lists multiple answers quickly. He's bound to get it. Uh, so Robert, let's see here. Let me make sure I'm getting to the top here. Uh, Jamie Shelley's the first, I think. I see, well, maybe I'm a little confused here. I see the first answer looks to be Jamie, major five chord. My question was, what is a minor seven? How do you spell the minor seven chord? And Robert Atkins was close with his first answer. He said one, flat three, five, and seven. Let's break that down. So a minor seven chord like this and you were almost right there Robert with one flat three and five that is the first part that's our triad a minor triad which is one flat three five then you said seven now technically Robert that would be this which is one of my favorite jazz chords a minor major seven chord but that is not correct for a minor seventh chord a minor seven chord is minor triad with a flat seven and it looks like Robert Atkins, you followed it up and you got that right. So I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. One, flat three, five, flat seven. That's absolutely correct. Blessing says minor triad with dominant seven. 
I think that I know exactly what you meant there. A dominant seventh chord has a major triad with a flat seven. So you could say that the dominant seventh chord has a flat seven. And for that reason, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. Um, but I do want to, I do want to uh, uh, put an asterisk by that and say that we have to remember it's actually called a flat seven there. All right, but I'm going to give it to you, blessing. Uh, Minor triad, flat seven. Elta John, you, are, you got it as well. So that's where we're going to leave it there, guys. But congratulations to everyone else. Charles Smith, you got it too. And, uh, but you were not in our top two. and uh, Top 2.5, let's say, because Blessings got it too. So good job, you guys. That's correct. Minor seven chord is a flat third. So a minor triad with a flat seven. You guys, I hope to see you next week, same time, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern. And depending on what you guys vote in user voice, we will, I'm not sure what we'll be covering yet, but we'll be covering whatever you vote as our top voted topic. All right, I'll see you guys then. And I'm going to have Harry finish out this lesson for us for anyone who's interested to see where he takes it. I'll see you guys next week. So now you've heard the form of Jingle Bells. You can hear that I'm playing Jingle Bells, but I'm sort of mixing notes up. All of the notes that I'm playing are not random. They're based on the chords that I'm playing. The first chord's an E-flat chord. Well, I can come at that note from the bottom. I can repeat that. Louis Armstrong did that a lot. One, two, uh-uh. He did that all the time. What is he doing? He's just kind of breaking up the melody a little bit with syncopation, which we've talked about, and the notes in the chord. That's basically what improvisation is. Let's play Jingle Bells again. I'll start it very, very slowly with very simple chords, and you can see what I'm doing, and I'll talk you through it. The first chord, a very simple E-flat chord in the melody, and I'll keep the beat about right here. One, two, three, uh. Melody's really boring like that, right? So let's swing it a little bit, like this. Same amount of time, same notes. Now let's add one or two more notes to make it a little bit more complicated. That's all it is. Now, what about this chord in the left hand? It's a little boring. So what happens if we maybe put an E flat down here and a major seventh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What if we start like that? Boy, I know what my left hand wants to do right now. I'm going to this chord. So, what does my left hand do? It goes from a major seventh to a dominant seventh. I'm playing two notes. And listen what it does when I'm playing the melody. Oh boy, you want to go here. Now what happens if I start here on the root and then go down and then go down? One note, listen to this. I'm going to keep going down. I did was a, a, I just did a chromatic scale. So that's, that's improvising. You can improvise in many different ways. You could do a gospel style. You could do a jazz style stride. kinds of styles. You could play that in a country style, but improvisation is 
starting with the fundamentals and slowly, slowly, slowly changing the rhythm, changing the chords. And here's the deal, y'all. Experiment with it. Like, there's no mistakes here. A anything you play is going to be part of the process. If I, if I had a nickel for every wrong note that I played on my albums, I'd have a, a, a lot of nickels. It's okay to try different things, experiment with different things, because now you know the basics. You know what the one is. You know what an inversion is. You know what a major chord is, a minor chord. These are all things that you've learned together with me to allow you to be able to improvise. And I promise you, if you stick with it, you'll be able to do it. Improvisation is, for me, like a kid being in a candy store. That's what the spirit of our country is. That's what jazz music is. It's improvisation. It's taking something, taking some structure, deconstructing it, and coming up with your own version. Whether it's a song that you made up or a famous song like Jingle Bells, improvisation is where your soul is. And if you've come this far with me and you're playing piano, then you have this in you to do it. Are you going to sound like me? No. And that's the best news I've, I've said all day because I'm not going to sound like you either. Your life experience, what you did today, what you had for breakfast, um, getting fired from that job or getting married or getting an A-plus on your test, all of those things are what's going to make you sound like you. And that's what jazz music is. It's improvisation and individuality based on structure. We got the structure part down, I think, by now. So go have some fun and go improvise.